Good evening, and welcome to the Cleveland Photographic Society Friday evening presentation for September 11th, 2020. We've got a great program for you this evening. We have our own Chris Camino here with us. Uh, he'll be talking about uh, his presentation of Behind the Eyes of a Stranger. Before we uh, get into the presentation, however, we have our president, Mike Kopkis, here, and he'll be going over some announcements for us. Hi, and welcome to our uh, presentation tonight. I'm uh, looking forward to hearing Chris uh, talk about his stranger photos. Uh, we do have a few announcements. Uh, the classes have begun. Uh, fundamentals started on September 2nd. Uh, Photoshop editing starts tomorrow, September 12th, and Lightroom starts on Monday, September 14th. On September 16th, uh, it's the deadline for the uh, nature competition, which takes place on September 25th. On September 18th, we have our bee competition. Unfortunately, the deadline for entry to that has already passed, but we certainly welcome you to to join us and listen to the competition, uh, see the competition, and listen to the comments of the judges. Uh, we want to remind you that the September 20th Back to the Wild field trip has been postponed, unfortunately. And then again, September 25th is our nature competition, nature and pictorial. Uh, we do also want to call your attention to the fact that we uh, our, we've contacted a company to create face masks, CPS branded face masks. Uh, there is an article in the snapshot. The link to purchasing those is in the snapshot. They're $10 a piece. Uh, you can find out a little bit more about them by looking at the snapshot link. And uh, the deadline for ordering is September 15th. We need to have an order of at least 50 uh, to go proceed. So, uh, we're still looking for a few more to, to finish that up. So if you're thinking about ordering one, please get your order in quickly. Uh, at this point, I'd like to um, introduce Chris Camino, um, and uh, he'll talk a little bit about his uh, project with strangers. Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Camino. A lot of you may be familiar with my stranger photography. I've been doing it for about eight years now. Um, and it was really when I was a beginning photographer when uh, I wanted to shoot people, uh, but uh, um, I didn't have any models willing to get in front of my camera lens. So I found out about this uh, uh, project called 100 Strangers Online, where you approach people on the street and take their picture. Little did I know back then, eight years ago, that uh, it would really turn into uh, a, a pretty major uh, undertaking that uh, I, I still, I still uh, work at. I have over 250 strangers now, and uh, uh, once, once this pandemic's over, hopefully I'll get a few more. <clears throat> so a few of you may be aware of that, uh, but what a lot of you may not be aware of is, is that uh, uh, for most of my stranger pictures, I've also uh, written a narrative that accompan accompanies the picture. And the narrative may be uh, kind of my uh, thought process during the picture, or it may be uh, uh, if I get to get, if I talk to the stranger a little bit, uh, I, I uh, may uh, share some details about their uh, life, or it may just be the encounter in general <coughs> uh, that, that, uh, um, uh, is in those stories, but I have a lot of them, and that's what I'm going to share with you tonight. I've done this for about 200 strangers. The last 50 or so strangers, I don't write the story quite as much, uh, but uh, uh, I, I think uh, you might uh, find interesting some of the things that happen when you walk up to people on the street and ask for their picture. So without further ado, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Did it switch? my presentation, Behind the Eyes of Strangers. And I'm going to start with Sal. Now, when describing himself to me, he smiled and said, I'm a humanitarian. It was clear that my soon-to-be 195th stranger Sal 
was a wayfarer when I first spotted him walking down the sidewalk in Coventry Village towards me. The well-worn backpack was certainly a clue, but he just had the look of a young man that was on a long expedition with no particular destination. His clothes and various accoutrements, such as the large crystal stricking, sticking through the bill in his cap, certainly made him stand out from the crowd. But as is so often the case, it was his eyes. They were sharp and green and piercing that set me in motion to secure a stranger portrait from him. After my approach and introduction, Sal and I shared quite a bit of time getting to know one another. He was indeed a cross between a Jack Kerouac era type hobo and a new age spiritualist, wandering wherever the breeze carries him. We talked about his travels all over the country, visiting friends, family, various art and music festivals. At one point, he nobly stated that he prefers to live entirely in the present and does not believe in making plans. However, our conversation eventually turned and led to him describing some of his personal goals and dreams. Those ambitions included uh, attending a business school, business management school founded by the Maharashi, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, as well as one day taking his traveling roadshow overseas. So good luck, Sal, and may the four winds blow you safely home in your life's journey. For this shot, I was scheduled to attend a business dinner way out in Ashtabula County. I had a little time to spare, so I decided to head up a little early to do a, uh, some covered bridge photography before dinner. After driving around half lost for a while, I finally located a bridge. I gathered my gear and headed down to the banks of the river. Just as I was sizing up my shot uh, is when a group of four young adults passed by me as they were meandering up the stream. They were entirely unconcerned with me as they were just having fun and playing around in the water. <clears throat> I immediately identified a blonde girl within the group as someone I thought would make a great stranger subject. And suddenly my intention shifted from bridge photography to stranger photography. However, the group had distanced themselves pretty uh, from me uh, uh, as they had made their way out to a small gravel bar located in the middle of the river. Now, I was wearing shoes and dockers for dinner. I, I certainly couldn't traverse a river. So I stood on the banks for a minute or two as I wasn't quite sure how I could make this uh, stranger portrait work. I decided I just couldn't let this opportunity pass by. So I suddenly called out across the water to the group. I caught the attention of my potential model's boyfriend. And it was he who started walking towards me through the ankle deep water. Once he neared, I started my Stranger Street portrait pitch. Although the girl had not yet approached yet, uh, I've, I've learned through experience that is, it is often more important to sell the boyfriend on a portrait. Because if the boyfriend uh, isn't on board, the portrait isn't going to happen. I began explaining my 100 Strangers project to the young man, and a few moments later, his girlfriend walked up behind him, just as I was expressing my desire to take her portrait. The two consulted with one another for a few moments, and then they both happily agreed to the shoot. I reached over the water and shook her hand as she introduced herself as Amber. The setup for the shot was a natural. The gravel bar jutted out in, to a point in the river. It was ideal. From the river bank, I described to Amber how I wanted her to pose, and she took these instructions very well. This is obviously the shot we ended up with, and I am quite pleased with the results especially considering I was just killing a little time before dinner. After about an hour walking downtown Cleveland streets of, in search of strangers, I decided to finish up for the day and head home. As I was driving down Prospect Avenue on my way out of town, I passed by a small group of African-American men congregated on the sidewalk. They were simply hanging out, socializing with one another, certainly not an unusual scene for a hot summer day in the city. I noticed an older man resting in a chair alongside the building, a little bit behind the others. He appeared to be the patriarch of the group. Although I had only uh, caught a glimpse as I drove by, he looked like a potentially compelling subject. I quickly decided to locate a parking spot so I could check him out a little closer. A minute later, I was footbound headed back toward my stranger candidate. Now, 
Approaching strangers can sometimes be a bit intimidated, intimidating, and this was absolutely one of those instances for me. As I neared my destination, I realized that as a white suburbanite with a camera strapped around my neck, I was about to enter a situation where I would be an outsider in every conceivable way. In fact, I started to seriously, seriously question the veracity of the move I was considering. However, once I neared my potential subject and I got a good look at him, I knew he was really someone I wanted to photograph. Now, as I mentioned, he was seated behind the group, so I was able to slip in and make my in initial introduction with him before the others even noticed. Now that I was talking with him face to face, uh, I could see that he was very old. He was sitting in a door well of a pawn shop, so I asked him if he owned the shop, and he replied that he only worked there. His name was George, and he expressed that he was agreeable to the portrait. I told him that he wouldn't have to move at all and that I would uh, photograph him right where he sat. Now, by this point, the rest of the group had finally noticed my intrusion. They were all amused by what was transpiring before them, and they immediately started making jokes, a bit directed towards me, but most of the good-natured ribbing was aimed at George. They kidded him by asking uh, him if he was going to become a high fashion model or something. Overall, everything seemed to be progressing well enough, and now that I had an audience, I figured I might as well take the next step and enlist, enlist one of the men to be my assistant by holding the reflector. Suddenly, it was a full-fledged team effort, and everyone there was fully vested in capturing this image. Everyone was having a good time, and it turned out to be a lot of fun. And after we were done, I expressed my gratitude to George and then thanked and shook hands with everyone in the group before I headed on my way. Now, in closing, at the end of my stranger encounter, I always offer to email a portrait of uh, a copy of the portrait back to my uh, stranger. But in this case, I got the feeling that George wasn't too computer savvy. Therefore, a few days later, I stopped by the pawn shop again this time to hand deliver a printed copy of this portrait to George. A few years ago, I was making several business trips to eastern Pennsylvania. At that time, my desire to do stranger photography was so great that I was motivated to do something I would normally never even consider, and that was that although I was staying over an hour outside of the city, I gathered my gear and I would travel into the hustle and bustle of downtown Philadelphia in search of strangers. On one of my trips to Philly, I was joined by another photographer who had expressed an interest in trying the 100 Strangers project. He was familiar with the city, so he suggested an area I had never, I had never visited, Rittenhouse Square, located just a few blocks from the city center. As I was driving in and nearing my def destination, I could tell that this would be great stranger hunting territory as the streets were brimming with a virtual cornucopia of potential models. I even caught sight of this particular Buddhist monk walking down the street with a fellow monk. But at that point, the picture was impossible as I was still trying to find a spot to park, which is no small feat for the uninitiated in Philadelphia. I eventually parked the car and met up with my friend. I immediately started gushing to him how excited I was to be in such fertile stranger territory. I even mentioned to him that I had seen a couple of Buddhist monks a few blocks back. Lo and behold, about a minute later, I spotted them again. This time, they were strolling across the square towards my general vicinity. I sprang into action. It was showtime. We caught up to the pair, and I began my rap. It quickly became obvious that the gentleman I was interested in photogra uh, photographing did not speak any English, and his companion only had a very limited grasp of the language. We were able to determine that the two of them were from Laos. However, my desire to take a portrait was not being effectively communicated. The language barrier was, was frustrating, and our, our encounter was beginning to break down. Uh, the companion politely started to just to wave us off and walk away. Now, I, I usually accept rejections at face value, but in this case, I felt there was simply a lack of understanding, so I gave it one more shot. I took a deep breath, I turned towards the gentleman, and I smiled and did my best to convey a sense of peace and serenity. I then calmly pointed at my camera and then gestured towards him. I then turned to the companion and asked how I could say thank you in the Laotian language. He stated, Kop Jai. 
I repeated the phrase as I cupped my hands together and respectfully bowed towards my stranger. At that point, he flashed a slight smile, straightened his posture, and subtly shifted his shoulders back. There it was. I had my pose. I quickly took a few shots. Now, I didn't think any other posing or shifting for background was going to be possible, but I was thrilled to have captured this shot. Before we parted ways, I asked him what his name was uh, and through the interpreter, and, and uh, he responded. And I think that might have been the only word he said. Uh, but it was so foreign to my ears that even if my memory was perfect, I'm sure I still could, would butcher the pronunciation. So therefore, Stranger 57 will remain nameless. I thanked him once again, and we went our separate ways. A little later that same evening, my friend initially directed my attention toward would-be Stranger 60 by mentioning the stroller she was pushing. I looked down and was amused to see a little dog riding in the place where you'd expect a, a baby. As we pa passed, my vision scanned up where, upward to see the driver of the stroller. I was thunderstruck. I had been wanting to photograph an older lady for months, and everything about Stranger 60 was perfect. She was colorful, her face had wonderful character, and she looked as dear and lovely as I could hope for. So we stepped aside for a few moments while I collected my thoughts on how to make this stranger portrait work. Now, I am perfectly aware that two grown men approaching an elderly lady might be a little unnerving for the lady, so I wanted to be as kind and as delicate as we possibly could. Whether she agreed to a portrait or not, I absolutely wanted her mind to be at ease, that we meant her no harm. As it turned out, once we approached her and said hello, she acted very friendly and seemed happy to chat. Our initial introduction went well with us talking about her little dog, Charlie. I eventually worked my way into the purpose of our meeting, a portrait, and she responded, you want to take my picture? Oh, I don't look good. I, I have bad al allergies right now. I was afraid of rejection was brewing, but then she continued. When I was much younger, I used to model in New York. At that moment, I was confident I, I could close the deal. I assured her that I thought she still had a wonderful photogenic spark and that she looked great. When I suggested that she model once more right here and right now, she immediately agreed to the photo shoot. Now, we were standing in a, in a park in a fairly wooded area, and with the evening sky beginning to grow dim, I didn't think we had sufficient light to make the picture work. So I asked her if we could walk with her for a little ways until we got to a, uh, an opening in the trees, and she agreed. As we walked, we continued our chat, and she proved to be a delightful lady the entire time. Now, on the other hand, her little poodle was none too pleased about our presence, and he snarled and snipped at us a couple of times, reminding us to keep our distance from his mother. Once we neared the clearing spot, I stepped ahead to capture the pseudo-candid shot that's on the left side here, and, and then we commenced to taking the portrait shot. At last, I had captured my sweet old lady portrait. Finally, I have not formally introduced you to Stranger 60 yet. When I asked her what her name was, she responded, Charlemagne. It wasn't until much later that I put it together that her, that her name was the same as her dog's. Was there some misunderstanding between us, or is it possible she would name her dog after herself? I asked my wife what she thought, and her response was, think about it. She's walking her dog in a stroller. So with that, I introduce you to Charlemagne and her little dog, Charlie. <clears throat> Back to Cleveland, and we had had a long string of sunny days here in Cleveland, so when the skies finally became overcast, I decided to make a beeline straight downtown to take advantage of nature's softbox. I spotted Stranger 83 coming up the street towards me, so I stopped and just waited for him. It was his bushy beard that initially caught my attention, but as he approached it was his soulful eyes and weathered face that I found most compelling. Now from his perspective, it must have been clear that I had noticed him and was waiting his arrival at the street corner where I was standing, because by the time he reached my proximity, our encounter seemed as inevitable as it did natural. He walked straight up to me, we greeted each other, shook hands, and began to chat. 
He introduced himself as Joe. When I finally got around to asking him for his portrait, his response was, Sure, I'm just on my way home to drink some beer. After I gave Joe a quick lesson on holding the reflector, we completed our shoot in just a few minutes. I didn't want to keep Joe away from his plans any longer, so I thanked him and we bid each other goodbye. As we parted ways, I called out to Joe. Hey, Joe, what kind of beer will you be drinking? Over his shoulder, he call, call, called back. Cold and wet, my friend. Cold and wet. I wanted to photograph my 198th stranger, Carissa, before I even saw her face. So this story starts with my wife and I, along with a few friends, squeezing into a jam-packed saloon for a cold libation during our recent Sunday afternoon pub crawl uh, during the Taste of Tremont Street, Street Festival. We were lucky enough to locate a small vacant table in the back corner of the tavern where we could sit and enjoy our brews. As we sat there tying one on, through the rowdy horde, I spotted a young lady with a colorful shoulder tattoo standing at the bar. My stranger senses were suddenly at high alert, and although I had only seen her from behind and had not yet viewed her face, pursuing a blind stranger portrait in such a raucous atmosphere seemed ill-advised at best, but the little voice inside of my head could not let it go. Therefore, I informed my companions that I was about to make a wild stab at the portrait, and off I went. It was so crowded that it, it took no small effort to elbow my way to the bar and then get in the vicinity, vicinity of my prospective model. And during this entire struggle, I still had not been able to get a glance at her face. I finally muscled my way uh, in front of her just as she and her friends knocked back a round of tequila shots. Two great things happened at that point. First, I saw her face, and I immediately knew my stranger senses were spot on. Secondly, she was totally game for a po portrait. Now, trying to make a clean portrait in this loud, chaotic, and crowded environment was bordering on insanity. Fortunately, the table where my group was seated was located along the back wall that included the only window in the entire bar, so my light source was ready-made. Now that I had the model and the light, Making it all come together in these shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder confines was still shaping up to be a challenge. I started by getting Chris opposed and positioned, and then we began to try to clear a line of sight through the drunken crowd. My companions and Chris's friends all helped by acting as human barriers as we attempted to part the crowd. It was difficult, but we managed to establish a narrow passage through the throngs of bar patrons carousing just outside of the frame of this picture. Despite the world of distraction surrounding us, once I lifted the camera to my eye, all of the noise and the chaos seemed to melt away as Carissa and I connected to make this portrait. <coughs> Cleveland's annual One World Festival is a true celebration of cultural diversity. Located in the city's cultural gardens, this, is one, this one day event brings together dozens of ethnicities from all around the world to share their music, dance, food, and heritage. I was there with my camera uh, when I got an unusual vibe as I was passing by a small gathering of people just simply standing around. Although there was no fanfare surrounding the group, nor did I know the purpose of this gathering, I had a distinct sense that something was about to happen. Centrally located amongst this group of people, about, about 20, uh, I caught sight of the woman who would become my 138th stranger. I liked her hair and the twinkle in her eye, and she was also wearing a long black robe. Now, mind you, I still had no idea the purpose of this gathering, but because of her robe, I jumped to the conclusion that she was a gospel singer, and she was about to perform. I thought that it might be cool to include a gospel singer in my project. Suddenly, there was a flurry of activity. About eight to 10 people with the group formed a semicircle around my stranger. They all then raised their right hand and the lady in the robe began to speak. I was stunned. My prospective stranger was not a gospel singer at all. She was a federal judge and she was administering the oath of US citizenship right in front of my eyes. I found myself as a surprise witness for the solemn naturalization ceremony. 
I'm so happy I had my camera at, at the ready as I was ca able to capture this image. A few minutes later, after the oath had been completed, the group began to slowly disperse. I spent a little time speaking to one of the new Americans. He was from Ukraine. He's the one in the middle here. Uh, and uh, his pride of, of his status as a U.S. citizen was palpable. It was really a moving moment, and I was honored to have had the opportunity to speak with him. Afterwards, my attention switched back to the lady in the black robe. My perspective had entirely changed now that I knew she was a judge. One does not approach a federal judge for frivolous endeavors, do they? My first incl inclination was to walk away. I cannot crash into a judge's world. However, I immediately started regretting the thought of passing. I had to essentially dare myself to approach her, and the next thing I knew, I was in front of her introducing myself. She stated that her name was Jessica, that although, frankly, I did not know whether I should address her by her name or your honor. The friendly face that had first captured my attention bore out in an equally friendly demeanor. We spoke a little bit about the ceremony that had just occurred, and then I moved on to my portrait request. She immediately and enthusiastically agreed to the request. Now I had to figure out how to make a decent portrait. I had given no pre-thought into the shot whatsoever, so I had to put this together on the spot. Right next to us was a freight truck with a broad white trailer. I don't do portraits with plain backgrounds very often, but at that moment it seemed like my best option. We quickly lined up this shot, and this is the result. In the past, I photographed other strangers in the course of their workday, but never in my wildest dreams could I imagine that I would capture a judge as she was attending to official duties. This project just never ceases to amaze me. So this was a traveling stranger as well. This is, uh, and I take strangers quite often, or stranger pictures quite often when, when we go on vacation. This, this was a shot that, uh, uh, from our family vacation to Hawaii. Uh, my family and I were out exploring Hanalei Bay during our first day of our vacation on the island of Kauai, Hawaii. I was enjoying my first day in paradise, and I was certainly not in stranger hunting mode right then and there. However, when I first caught sight of Stranger 75, he struck me as the quintessential island beach surfer dude, and I wanted his portrait. Once I get this bug to capture a stranger portrait, I pretty much have to act, so I approached the young man and began my usual project explanation. He was happy to oblige my request, and a few minutes later, we captured this portrait. But that is only the beginning of the story. We got to talking, and it turned out he was not a native of Hawaii at all. In fact, he's from Ohio, Hartville, Ohio, to be specific. He was, however, living in Kauai, as he had bought a one-way ticket to Hawaii nearly a year uh, previous. It also turns out that he's never surfed in his life. Go figure. Eventually, my wife joined in, and we ended up having lunch together. During our spirited conversation, Jacob presented himself as a business manager, and he had a great passion for the big ideas on how he was making his fortune. At times, I thought he might have millions already tucked away and was just living the life as a Hawaiian beach bum. But at other times, I pretty much figured he was uh, just that, a beach bum, and had nothing but the, the shorts and the sandals on his feet to his name. Jacob mentioned that he was planning to meet some friends at another beach down the coast, so I offered to give him a ride. I left my family, they weren't too pleased with that, but and Jacob and I headed across the north shore of Kauai. We eventually found ourselves meeting up with Jacob's friends who were comfortably sitting under a shade tree at some unnamed beach. It was an incredibly friendly and unassuming scene. I introduced my, myself using my nickname Paco, and with, one, and with that, one of the people there broke out into song. He played guitar and sang an amusing original song, Paco's Tacos, about a local fish taco, on the, or fish taco joint on the island. He then handed me his blue acoustic guitar and asked me if I played. Now, mind you, I know how to strum about four chords, but the mood seemed right. So the next thing I know, I'm playing guitar and singing on the beach with a bunch of locals. That opened up the door to a great afternoon, having fun conversations with all the folks there. 
I was introduced to the spiritual way that residents of Kauai regard their island. I recall a woman who told a wonderful story about her totems or spirit animals, all, of course, related to Hawaiian life. I never have conversations like this back in Ohio. <clears throat> I could never imagine my first day in Kauai would turn out like this, but there I was on the beach playing the guitar and singing. All it took was me asking for a stranger, asking a stranger for a portrait. A few days later, during our Hawaiian vacation, we had the opportunity to visit the Nepali coast of Kauai. This area is one of the most beautiful places on earth, located on the western coast of Kauai. It is a vast and remote area, and it is inaccessible by road. The only way to get there over land is a long and arduous hike, typically requiring an overnight camping stay. A much, much less strenuous approach is by boat, and that is precisely how uh, my family and I toured this spectacular coastline. We had just embarked on our charter boat adventure, and we were still making our way up the civilized portion of the coastline. As we were passing by some of the final accessible beaches before entering the re real wilderness, we noticed a young couple dealing with their Jeep that appeared to be bogged down in the sandy beach. Once our boat captain saw them, he indicated they were friends of his, and he steered his vessel a little closer to shore and cut the engines. Are you stuck? Our captain shouted out to shore. The male half of the couple looked up with a big grin and replied laughingly, not yet, we have a few inches before we're totally bottomed out. I just love Hawaii's hang loose attitude. Meanwhile, the female half of the couple pranced into the water and started swimming out towards the boat. I guess we were about 100 feet out. Once she neared, she called out, how about, how about a couple of guava juices? Our captain obliged and headed for the cooler. Now, I realized the fun stranger opportunity in front of me and immediately went for my camera. My usual project explanation request was, was cut down to a simple can I take your picture? And she replied in the positive, and this was the pose she offered me before she swam back to shore. A minute later, we were headed back up the coast. Since my stranger was not readily available, I described the pro project to my captain. He told me that her name was Madeline, and then quickly corrected himself, saying she, she goes by the name Mads. She's a fellow charter boat captain and a longtime good friend. A few hours later, we passed by the same spot on our return voyage. Mads, her companion, and the Jeep were gone. Obviously, their car dilemma was not too bad. Hang loose. Okay, so back to Ohio, and back to Tremont, which is where I captured this portrait of my 92nd stranger, Joyce, during the annual Tremont, Tremont Art Festival. This is obviously a bit of, the, of a departure from my usual street portraiture. I'll definitely tell you it was an unusual setup and the fact that I convinced a lady I had just met 60 seconds earlier to pose with her hands on her face was, well, well, it was absurd. Believe it or not, with all the extraordinary prep for this one, I only pressed my shutter release two times and I'm lucky, lucky to have captured this usable image that you see uh, here. I mean, everything was going fine with Joyce in our photo shoot, and I was hopeful I was going to get uh, several different po poses from Joyce, uh, although I'm sure that she thought I was crazy. Right as I was getting my second capture, a loud voice bellowed from behind, What's going on here? I looked around to see a rather large and imposing man staring down at me. I immediately figured that I had crossed some line and I was probably photographing his mother. A little fast explanation seemed to be in order, so I quickly began to describe my project to the hovering Hulk. I also informed him that I would be happy to share the portrait with him. Well, how much does it cost, was his response. Well, I, I don't charge anything, really, no strings attached. I just enjoy photographing people. It's what I do. At that point, another lady joined him, I assumed his wife, and he turned to her to say, Hey, maybe this guy will take our picture, but I don't know how much it cost. It was about this time I looked down and discovered that Joyce was gone. Turns out she wasn't this man's mother after all. And she used this, this unusual interruption as an opportunity to escape. 
and I knew she thought I was crazy. As far as the burly man breathing over me was concerned, well, I, I guess he just assumed that I was a working part of the art festival and, and that I was doing portraits for hire. It was a strange turn of events. As I was piecing all of this together in my head, I decided it was time to shift gears. I'd, I'd be happy to take your picture of, of the two of you and send it to you, no charge really, but I would also really appreciate it if you would let me photograph you individually. You have such a strong presence and I love the features of your face. I think your portrait would be great, uh, be a great addition to my project. At that point, he roared with laughter and said to his wife, Huh, you hear that? He loves me. <laughs> his name was Butch, and he agreed to my offer. I started scanning the area for a decent background, and it was at that moment the clouds suddenly broke and the sun made its first appearance of what had been an overcast day. Amazingly, the sun was shining from directly behind Butch, and a virtual halo appeared around his head, as if the portrait was calling out to me. I shot him right there where he stood. And then after I sh uh, shot, I took a few pictures of Butch and his wife. I'm still waiting to hear back from them so I can send them their free portrait. Okay, so fast forward here two years, and I'm still in Tremont. This was the day before Thanksgiving, and I was dropping off a tur turkey at St. Augustine for their annual holiday food drive. It was a beautiful November afternoon, so I decided to park a few blocks away from the church so that I could walk and enjoy the weather. As I strolled down the sidewalk, I spotted these two gentlemen sitting uh, together in an otherwise empty park. I had my camera with me, so I thought, what the heck, let's try for a stranger portrait. I approached the men and introduced myself and began to describe my 100 strangers project. The man on the right interrupted me. Would we be counted as one stranger or two? I thought about it, and I intended to shoot them together, so I responded, well, this will be a singular pic picture, so it'll only count as one. And I continued, jokingly, I guess the both of you will only count as half a stranger. The man chuckled and agreed to the shot. I then asked what their names were. The man on the right first introduced himself to me as Mike, and then on the, man, the man on the left told me his name, was Butch. Butch? But I had taken a portrait of a man named Butch in this very park two years earlier. I looked at him closely and exclaimed that I believed I had already taken his picture. Butch had no recollection of me, but I went to my iPhone and quickly received the, the portrait of Stranger uh, 93. Is this you? It was him. <laughs> I had not initially recognized him because when I first met him, I described him as large and imposing, roaring with laughter. I had full recollection of the encounter because it was as humorous as it was impressionable. However, the man that was now sitting before me was just the opposite. He struck me as diminished and weary. It appeared that the past two years had been difficult for Butch. As I shared the portrait with Butch and Mike, I merrily recounted our first encounter. Uh, however, when I mentioned that Butch had been accompanied by a lady, I immediately realized that I had tripped over something painful. Butch, and even Mike to a certain extent, seemed to withdraw, and the sense of melancholy and loss was pronounced. I immediately regretted the dark place I had just stumbled into, and I looked to change course. Well, I guess it looks like you'll be a whole stranger after all, Mike. I, I can't really count Butch as a stranger anymore, I blurted out in an attempt to lighten the mood. I began to retrieve my camera from the bag, and during that short period, Mike leaned over and began to softly speak to Butch. I could not hear his words, but he seemed to be consoling him. I felt as though I had just become come invisible as a were paying no attention to me. So without a word, I proceeded to compose and capture this image. A few seconds later, I finished. I concluded the encounter by wishing them both a happy Thanksgiving. Mike returned their well wishes, as did Butch, who also added in a soft and breaking voice, may God bless you. Well, may God bless you as well, Butch. Hands, hands. What kind of hands can I shoot? 
This is the question I had been asking myself for over a week. You see, hands was the topic of the CPS challenge that I was participating in. And frankly, I wasn't feeling it. No particularly inspirational ideas were coming to me. I've also been doing a heavy road travel business week across the Midwest, so time for photography was limited at best. I had all but resigned myself to not going to be able to have an entry for this week's challenge. However, out of the blue, opportunity knocked. Now, Dyersburg, Tennessee is a little backwater located just east of the Mississippi River. Returning from my dinner alone and in the dark, uh, I was making the final home stretch to my room at the Holiday Inn Express. I was exhausted, and the last thing in the world on my mind was photo photography. I just wanted to get to my room and retire for the evening. I entered the elevator and pressed three for my floor. As the door was closing, I saw a man hurrying his way towards the elevator. I quickly stopped the doors uh, so he could enter. As the doors closed again, we started our short ascent. I glanced over to size up my new fellow rider. He was a roughneck coming in from a hard day's work. And looking down, what's that? A worn and faded tattoo across his dirty and calloused right hand. My stranger, uh, my stranger radar suddenly jumped as I sensed that there may be some stories in those hands. Could this be the hand shot that I had already given up on? Do I actually have the nerve to confront a stranger on an elevator? I had to make a decision fast because the doors opened and the gentleman began his first step out of the elevator. He did not reach his third step before I finally broke. Excuse me, sir. My name is Chris and I'm a photographer. And there I was, starting my stranger pitch. His name was Aaron and he was returning from a day of outdoor manual work. My sudden burst of enthusiasm about his hands must have been persuasive because he was agreeable to the impromptu hand modeling shoot. Uh, even better, after I quickly retrieved my camera from my room, he agreed to return to the lobby with me so that we could set up some sort of decent looking shot. I've, I've never done a hand portrait before, so I had no notion of how to proceed or what to expect. Once in the lobby area, I quickly identified a small desk lamp sitting atop the dark breakfast bar counter as an attractive light source and background. And this is where we set up shop. Before, when we were in the elevator, the only tattoo I could really see was the fleur de lis on his uh, right back hand. It wasn't until we got busy with the shoot that I saw the faded lettering across his knuckles. Hold fast, <laughs> right on. And I take this moment to, to uh, uh, remind everyone, if, if you're not familiar with the uh, CPS challenge uh, and, uh, or you, you are familiar with it but haven't been there for a while, I, I really uh, encourage you to stop by and check it out. It's, it's a great way to get motivation for taking pictures and uh, work on different techniques and take pictures that you wouldn't normally do, such as this one. This picture would not exist for the, uh, 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 if it wasn't for the CPS challenge. And now I just couldn't be happier that I have this picture in my uh, stranger gallery. So, so you never know what will come of it. Check it out. You, you may uh, find yourself having a good time. Now, with this stranger, first off, I, I have to confess that photographing a stranger wearing a hijab or a burqa was kind of on my project bucket list. It has been an elusive portrait until now because finding the right stranger and getting the right timing and situation and, and then having the nerve to cross the cultural barrier is a difficult trifecta to achieve. I initially saw a stranger 70 sitting on his park bench where she was having a lively conversation with a young man. Now, I, of, course, of course I couldn't be certain what they were discussing, but they had a large book with gold-edged pages open between them. I thought it to be some sort of religious manuscript. I've learned that making assumptions about strangers is usually full of pitfalls, but I did not think that they were a couple, as he was Caucasian, blonde, and looked like he came straight from the church choir. From my vantage point across the way, the young lady wearing the hijab looked to be an enticing potential stranger. But the spirited nature of their conversation uh, made me hesitant about interrupting. To make it even less inviting, they were sitting in a really dark shadows. So I would have had to have her move to a different location to get acceptable lighting. 
I begrudgingly decided to take a pass. I continued to search for potential strangers around town, and about an hour later, after I doubled back, I spotted the pair again, this time walking down the street together. I wasn't going to miss this opportunity again, so it was time for action. They were strolling down the opposite side of a busy street as I was, so I had to hurry my way uh, uh, down to get to a crosswalk in 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 an attempt to get ahead of them. I finally caught up to them two blocks later, and, <clears throat> and, um, and although my hurried pursuit had left me uh, out of breath, I began my stranger project rap. My stranger candidate beamed and seemed genuinely delighted that I would ask her for a portrait. She asked her companion what he thought, and this is where my problems began. He said that they were late for an appointment and didn't have time. I turned back to my stranger and assured her that it would only take a minute or two. When she expressed a desire to go on with the portrait, my foil had to begrudgingly resign himself to this minor delay. Now, knowing I was on the clock, I worked quickly to position my model and get my camera ready. I thought I might be able to loosen up my grumpy friend by asking him to assist me and hold the, ref- and hold the reflector. He agreed to this task, but in an entirely passive-aggressive way. My stranger, on the other hand, was just absolutely delightful. She asked me if I wanted her to to smile or look serious. I told her we could try both, but let's start with serious. I focused and got this first shot. Now, one thing I typically do when shooting a portrait is to try to keep some sort of encouraging patter going with my uh, model. In this case, I can't honestly remember what I was saying, but it must have been something to the effect of, oh my God, you just look fantastic. At that instance, the man was triggered. He threw up his arms and cried out, No, he's using the Lord's name in vain. I was flabbergasted by his dramatic reaction. I apologized profusely, stating that I certainly did not mean to offend, but he was in no mood to offer absolution, only a torrent of harumphs and eye rolls. I turned to take another shot, and although my stranger was still game and looking lovely, my antagonist was at my side sighing heavily and giving me the stink eye. It was clear that this encounter had unraveled, so I smiled to my stranger uh, and said that I was done and thanked her for her participation. She was smiling and still very good-natured, but her companion was already walking away, so she had to scurry off. I did not even get a chance to ask her name. I regret that we couldn't, could not have spent a little bit more time together under less hostile conditions. Although I am pleased with this portrait I got, It would have been nice to share a few words with this stranger, and maybe even connect on a human level, even if just for a minute or two. It's a shame, really, but I do have my bucket list uh, stranger checked off. I had long been enticed by the idea of including a bride and a groom portrait as part of my project. The the opportunity to capture such a portrait presented itself on Valentine's Day. I learned that on that day, the Municipal Court of Cleveland makes makes a justice of the peace available for walk-up weddings in the atrium of the Tower City Shopping Center. I figured I would pop in and get a quick stranger portrait. However, as is often the case, things aren't quite as easy as I originally conceived. I arrived at the location and was greeted by a rather unreal scene. There were several dozen pairs of brides and grooms joined by their friends and family, all excitedly gathered outside the food court. My problem certainly wasn't the availability of strangers. What concerned me was that these people were all extremely occupied with the serious matter of their looming wedding ceremony, and I felt it might be a bit disrespectful to crash in on their special day. I determined that I should really take my time and carefully identify the right stranger and situation. Now, as is often the case, the moment I saw my stranger candidates, I knew that they were the ones. There was just something about them that stood out, probably in part due to the groom's brilliantly white tuxedo. The two of them looked a bit lost as they wound their way through the crowd, and when I finally caught up to them, I learned that they had just arrived and they had yet to find the rest of their wedding party, let alone register to to be wed. Joshua said that uh, they would be happy to do the portrait, but first they had to take care of business as the uh, 
uh, as the ceremonies had already started. Of course, I understood, but I was also worried that he and his bride would realize other priorities and blow off my stranger request. It turned out that I had nothing to worry about as Joshua and Tara tracked me down just a few minutes later. I never photographed a wedding, and frankly, it's something that I don't really aspire to. Too much pressure to get that perfect shot. <laughs> it's altogether appropriate that my first experience with wedding portraiture would be part of my project with all the on-the-spot juggling act uh, that stranger shots can present. In this case, we were in a shopping mall, and it was really crowded. Before I'd even met Joshua and Tara, I had the foresight to scope out a small area in front of a couple of massive columns that might provide a clean backdrop. Fortunately, this atrium area of the mall was well lit with natural light emitting from the high glass ceiling. I also had a friend with me who was able to work the reflector. So our game plan was pretty much set once Joshua and Tara were ready. So the photo shoot was efficient and we only took a couple of minutes and even that left little time to spare. Literally 10 minutes after this shot was taken, they were legally wed as man and wife. My favorite part of this day occurred a little later though, as I was still mulling around the crowd, I happened by Joshua and Tara again, and this time they were with their entire family, and they were passing around phone cameras, capturing various family portraits. Now, I couldn't just pass by knowing phone selfies were the basis of the wedding album, so for a second time, I crashed the wedding, time, wedding day. This time, I offered to take family shots. It was clear that Joshua and Tara appreciated the offer, although I have to imagine some of their family members had to be wondering, who is this guy suddenly appearing out of the crowd? Here's, here's one of the family pictures uh, uh, that I took. Afterwards, as we were exchanging email addresses, Joshua asked me, how, how much was I going to charge him? Well, I don't charge for my stranger shots, Joshua, and besides that, this has been entirely my honor. Please consider these photos as my wedding gift to you and your lovely bride. Another shot right uh, by uh, Tower City, uh, but this one uh, not quite as much love and goodwill. In fact, this was an event more born of anger. This was an anti-police rally being held in response to the then recent events uh, that included the uh, Michael Brown shooting in Ferguson, Missouri, as well as the Tamir Rice shooting here in Cleveland. The protest was tiny in comparison to the BLM de demonstrations seen in major cities today, but it was certainly one of the seeds of discontent that has now overtaken the nation. Now, let me state that I attended this event strictly as a photojournalist, not as a participant. Wintertime makes for uh, lean photo opportunities for street photographers in Cleveland. So when I saw the local news hyping this rally in the days leading up, I looked at it as simply an opportunity to get out and capture a few street shots. Now, it was a cold, gray December Cleveland day. The dreary ref weather reflected well the underlying mood but the anti-police sentiments being shouted by the participants were burning hot with venom. The rally was just getting underway in, in public square and the primary action going on at this point was that various protesters were taking turns shouting through the megaphone, each trying to agitate the crowd of about 100 people into a frenzied state. It was an angry affair and this is where I first st spotted Stranger 144. He was standing solitary and silent in the background, just a few steps behind the various megaphone speakers, or barkers as was the case. He had a very serious demeanor and was dressed from head to toe in black militant uniform. As stranger encounters go, stranger 144 and the surrounding chaos was by far the most imposing test I have ever faced. I really must have been out of my mind to even consider what I was about to do. So by the time I worked the nerve to approach him, the crowd's fury had int intensified as the air was filled with a continuous stream of inflammatory shouting and chanting. Despite this incredibly hostile environment, I approached my stranger in a friendly manner. I began by complimenting his uniform. He looked over and he didn't seem to outright discount me, so I con continued my chatter. 
I asked his name. He told me it was Herbert. And I noticed one of the patches sewn on of his leather jacket had the embroidered letters BMA. And I asked him what those letters represented. He told me that it stood for Black Man Army and that he was a sergeant major within those ranks. Now, I could tell Herbert was about to shut me down, so I quickly moved on and requested a portrait. Amazingly, he agreed. I obviously had to shoot him just where he stood because asking him to change locations was just entirely out of the question. Therefore, I had to back up a few steps to get him adequate, adequately into frame, but this put me almost at center stage, essentially back to back with the megaphone barkers inciting the crowd. A couple of nearby anarchists noticed me and, and began to shout profanities at me as I was clearly an interloper. I remained calm and prepared for the shot. Before I hit the shutter release but button, I looked up at and asked Herbert, Herbert to lower his chin just a little. His movement was barely perceptible, but his glare was loud and clear as if to say, you are pushing your luck. Snap, and this is the portrait I captured at that instant. I introduce to you Sergeant Major Herbert of the Black Man Army. Now I'd like to break from uh, 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 the, the Stranger story for just a moment to show you a few rapid-fire Stranger portraits. Um, all of these portraits were, portraits were taken uh, just outside of Cleveland's annual tattoo convention, which is held in late January uh, or early February. I love searching for strangers at this event because not only is it a cornuco cornucopia of interesting strangers, but it is one of the few good opportunities I have to find deep, a deep pool of potential models in the middle of winter. In fact, over the past several years, the tattoo convention is kind of like my kickoff event for each new year of stranger photography. Uh, this year, the tattoo convention turned out to be my sole event before the pandemic uh, hit. Uh, this event is inevitably turns out to be a high watermark for me each year in terms of the quantity of portraits captured at a single event as well as an interestingness of the people I meet. Just, just one of my favorites. So for the tattoo convention, I've decided to showcase this young man, uh, Doug, as my tattoo convention stranger. Now, I typically avoid potential stranger models in costume because I prefer or try to catch a person's true nature as opposed to a character they might be portraying. Therefore, the first time I spotted Doug, I decided to take a pass, although I was admittedly intrigued by his unusual face paint. An hour later, I passed him again, and there seemed to be an authenticity to his aura. So the second time around, I couldn't resist asking him for a portrait, and my hunch was correct. I wasted no time in asking him about his face, mat, face paint, and he proce proceeded to explain to me that the makeup was a result of an extensive gene genealogical search that he had performed on his family tree. He told me that he was able to trace his roots back nearly a thousand years to Scandinavian or origins. His face paint signifies that heritage. The markings on his face are an ancient Nordic design that warriors, and perhaps Vikings, might have donned when going into battle. Doug told me that uh, he almost always wears this face paint when he goes out in public, uh, but not when he goes to work. They kind of disapprove there. He was clearly proud of his heritage as we chatted for a considerable uh, amount of time about how he com commemorates his family origins in his everyday life. An example is that he has built a replica of a horn that they would have used in uh, me medieval Scandinavia. Uh, he belongs to a heavy metal rock band, and he has incorporated this horn into some of the songs they perform. And he actually played me a vi vi video, which was, well, well, it was different. <laughs> you just never know what you're going to learn when you meet a stranger. So here's my group shot of 50,000 strangers all at once. No, no, really. Recently, my wife and I decided to embark on uh, a tour of Major League Baseball stadiums. And what better way to start our odyssey than to travel to Yankee Stadium in the heart of New York City? Our maiden foray on this tour turned out to be even more fun than we had anticipated. Just a great day. And even though our Indians came up on the short side of the scoreboard, 
It was an exciting game, and the entire experience that hot Saturday afternoon was simply a blast. After the game, we were milling around outside the stadium, get, getting some parting pictures, and that's when I heard someone from behind giving me grief about the loss the tribe had just experienced. I turned around, and there were the subjects of my soon-to-be Stranger Portrait 244. The shorter man in the hat was the one doing the ribbing, in a high-pitched, Joe Pesci-like, heavy New York accent, while his uber-tough-looking friend just kind of watched on in amusement. When we caught each other's eyes, he started asking me if I was going to need psychiatric help after the devastating loss the Indians had just experienced. Now, I could clearly see that there was no real hostility in his tone or mannerism. He was simply enjoying busting my balls, exactly what one would expect from a wise guy Yankee fan. <clears throat> One of the most wonderful personal results from my Stranger Photography pro project is that before I, I probably would have simply moved along and tried to avoid this confrontation. But now I look at these type of situations as an op opportunity to experience a slice of life. Although at this point I had zero intention of making a Stranger uh, portrait, I approached my antagonist just to see what might unfold. Of course, I was looking for a friendly encounter, so I greeted him, greeted him with a smile and full concession that the Yankees were dominant, at least on that particular day. He continued to crow about the Yankees' victory for a little while, but it was only a couple of minutes before he was really offering respect and love for the Indians. Well, at that point, we were in the playoff hunt, but also as well as the city of Cleveland. He introduced himself as Tommy, and in the next sentence, he introduced his large and imposing friend, Tommy. Now, Big Tommy was not as verbose as his shorter counterpart, but he did participate in conversation in a very friendly manner. So there we were, my wife and I chatting and getting to know Tommy and Tommy outside the home of the Bronx Bombers. In our 15 to 20 minute meeting, we shared details of each of our lives' journey. I thought the most amusing revelation was that Tommy and Tommy were going to visit Coney Island the very next day. Little Tommy was excited because Big Tommy had never ridden a roller coaster in his entire life. So he was going to take him for a ride on Coney Island's famous cyclone roller coaster. I can only imagine how that episode played out. My camera was still hanging around my neck. Uh, so when little Tommy eventually noticed it, he offered to take a picture of my wife and I. That's when it occurred to me that the picture I really wanted to capture was that of Tommy and Tommy. Big Tommy was a fantastic model, as he was one of the most imposing strangers I've ever had the nerve to capture, complete with teardrop prison tattoo. And then there was little Tommy, the quintessential fast-talking New York wise guy. I described my stranger's project to them and, and, and then requested a portrait. Now, by this time, we were fast friends, so there were, they were only too happy to oblige. And I now have this portrait, and I cherish it as a memento of our New York trip uh, as much as any souvenir I could have ever purchased in a, in a gift shop. We were uh, getting ready to part ways when Tommy, and I can't remember which one, asked if we were going to stands. Now, there are several bars nearby the stadium catering to Yankee fandom, and Tommy and Tommy informed us that stands was considered the top one. They gave us general directions on how to get there, and then off they went to continue their celebration of the Yankees' win. A little later, my wife and I did eventually make our way to stands. It was loud and crowded and drunken and as raucous as it could be. In other words, the perfect end to a perfect afternoon in the Yankee universe. Thanks, Tommy and Tommy, for the recommendation as well as a little slice of New York hospitality that you served up to us that day. It had been nearly five years since I first started my stranger project, and I was up to my 200th stranger. I never could have imagined the journey that this project would become for me. My original goal in undertaking this project was to simply become a little bit more sure-handed with portrait photography, and I'd certainly achieved that goal. But the unexpected benefit was the growth I've experienced as a person and my appreciation for the societal world around me. This has truly been a life-changing experience for me. So now that I was on the precipice of my 200th portrait, 
I really desired to find a standout model for this momentous occasion. I initially saw, spotted my would-be 200th stranger as I was sitting in my car, sitting at a traffic signal in front of the West Side Market. <clears throat> Although I wasn't really in a position to act on this stranger, I knew I would be filled with regret if I let this opportunity slip by. So I quickly parked the car and hurried into the market with hopes of seeing her again. I was frantically searching through the labyrinth of the market when I turned a corner and bam! Suddenly she was standing right in front of me. Her name was Taishaya, and she was more than happy to be the subject of my 200th portrait. She even agreed to follow me outside so that we might get a be better lighting and background. And so I was finally set to finish my second set of 100 strangers. In the middle of our photo shoot, Taishaya suddenly paused and had to take a few mom moments to collect herself. With a tear in her eye, she stated that she was deeply appreciative that I had asked her to be the subject of my 200th stranger portrait. She explained that a few days earlier she had experienced a miscarriage and that she had been feeling pretty down ever since. The fact that a complete stranger would approach her and compliment her beauty served to lift her spirits and self-esteem. She thanked me, but in truth, it was I who owed her a debt of gratitude. For weeks, I had been actively searching for that special someone to be my milestone 200th stranger. Ironically, although I was drawn to Taishaya's photogenic qualities, it turned out to be her vulnerable humanity that will have the lasting impact on me. It is altogether appropriate that as I close this round of 100 strangers, um, I experienced such a compelling encounter that harkens me back to the true meaning and power of this project. And finally, I'm going to finish up with this final portrait of my 141st stranger, Lucy. I met Lucy on the day before Thanksgiving outside of the West Side Market, and I wrote this narrative of our meeting the very next day, Thanksgiving morning. It occurred to me then that this stranger encounter was an example of the many small blessings that occur on a daily basis, the blessing of shared humanity. And so I introduce you to Lucy. I was standing out in front of the market that day, specifically searching for strangers, but nobody had really particularly piqued my interest. It was looking like the day was going to be a bust. Then, out of the blue, Lucy approached me. She, she led off by asking me about the circular case hanging from my belt. I told her it was a reflector. She started laughing and saying that she had thought it might be a tambourine, tambourine case. She said that if it had been a tambourine case, we would have been, she would have pulled out her harmonica and the two of us could have had an impromptu street jam session. And so the two of us stood on that street corner, getting to know one, one another on a chilly November afternoon. Lucy told a few jokes, and she said that she had considered being a stand-up comic at one point, but we also touched on several more personal matters. At times, Lucy even welled up a bit, not necessarily because of anything directly in her life, but because of challenges that others face. We stood there, for talking, we, we stood there talking for well over a half an hour, two strangers enjoying each other's company, such a simple thing, such an unlikely thing. Yet there we were, sharing our goodwill. Now, for most of the encounter, a stranger portrait was not really even a consideration for me. But as we con continued chatting, it gradually occurred to me that Lucy's personality was so colorful, uh, as colorful as her hat and scarf, and I wanted to capture some of that as a memento of our meeting. When I finally broached the subject of the portrait, Lucy agreed, but she insisted that we include her Bible in the picture. She also expressed a little hesitation about the portrait. I, I don't look good in pictures because of my teeth. Well, you don't have to smile, I replied. And in fact, most of my strangers give me a serious look. We then proceeded to take a, few, uh, a quick series of photos with Lucy being straight-faced and her lips closed. As I moved my perspective, I told her that I wanted to take a few more shots. And at that point, she burst out laughing and says, I have to smile because that's who I am. And I am entirely happy that she made that decision so we could make this portrait. As our encounter was wrapping up, she told me she wanted to sing me a song. 
She then reached into her pocket and pulled out her aforementioned harmonica. She then proceeded to sing and play a, a, an improvisational blues tune based on my name and our encounter. The woman had some talent. We then wished each other well as she headed on, on her way down the avenue. Looking back, I truly cherish my short time with Lucy, especially now considering the craziness and the supposed division that has ensnared our entire nation. You, you know, even before social dis distancing became a thing, people tended to build invisible barriers around themselves in order to avoid contact with strangers. And, I mean, I get it. We all need to keep our societal guard up. However, through my experience with the 100 Strangers Project, I found that if one is willing to reach through that barrier, you may find someone else on the other side who is willing to reach back to you. And then maybe, just maybe, something wonderful might happen. Like the everyday little miracle that Lucy and I experience. And after all, isn't that what humanity is about? So that'll do it for me. Uh, if you guys have any questions about uh, uh, the presentation in general, or uh, would like to ask me about uh, stranger photography, you can uh, drop me an email at uh, camino.image at gmail. Or if you'd like to check out more of my pictures and more of my stories, I have all of them listed on Flickr at, uh, at the address you see there. Uh, and th that's all my pictures. If you want to see just the stranger pictures, you'd have to click on the tab that says albums, and then you'll see the 100 stranger uh, albums uh, within there. So anyways, thank you all so much for sticking with me through this, and uh, have a good one. Talk, see you all later. Well, thanks, Chris. We really appreciate you sharing not only the uh, wonderful photos, but the stories behind them. Uh, we've had some people uh, write in uh, about our uh, Friday presentations, and some of them have asked uh, that, uh, that we give them a little bit of information about uh, some of the technical aspects of how some of the pictures were taken. Uh, could you share with us a little bit about uh, some of the equipment that you use and how you, uh, how you choose to pose people, um, finding uh, impromptu uh, backgrounds and, uh, and good light? Well, I got to say, Rob, it, it, it uh, kind of changes from stranger to stranger. I, I will say that um, when you're doing it on the street, as, as I said in one of my descriptions, it's a bit of a juggling act. I'm always aware of the direction of this, that the light is coming from, and uh, and I am always kind of looking for that background. So um, often I choose a background before I even choose my strangers. So so um, uh, all I can say is it, it it's taken a lot of work. Uh, I, I by no means am, have got it down pat, but uh, uh, certainly experience has helped me uh, uh, feel more comfortable with things and kind of be able to co compose things uh, a little bit more easily. Okay, what kind of equipment and lenses do you use? Well, I, I have a Nikon, and uh, I started off with a small starter camera, Ni Nikon D3100, um, and, and I almost exclusively use prime lens. For the 3100, it, it was a, a, a 50 millimeter lens. Uh, I graduated to a full frame uh, Nikon, a D600, and um, I use a, a portrait lens for that as well, and it goes down to uh, f1.4 uh, aperture. So, so, you know, definitely when you get a portrait lens, you're looking for that shallow depth of field. Uh, so that's what I use. I, I always have my reflector with me. Uh, don't necessarily use it all the time, but um, if, if I'm out, out, out on the stranger hunt, I do have it with me just in case. Yeah. The results are, uh, are outstanding. You get those beautiful creamy backgrounds and you always get some decent light on the faces. So whatever you're doing is paying off. And again, it's great to hear the stories behind what's going on. Thanks so much for being with us this evening and sharing uh, your talent and your stories with us. You're welcome. Oops. Well, that's going to conclude tonight's event. Um, if you're interested in any more information about the Cleveland Photographic Society, we have a pretty extensive website. You can reach us there at www.clevelandphoto.org. Um, and we do appreciate uh, your feedback. Uh, we, we get uh, 
feedback from a few people each week, and we do try to tailor our presentations to meet the, the needs of the folks that are writing in. So if you have any comments or uh, suggestions, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to send us an email. You can reach us at info at clevelandphoto.org. That's great. We will uh, hope you enjoyed this evening's presentation, and we will look forward to seeing you here again next Friday. Take care. Stay safe.